Hello, I'm Gordon Gidlin with the San Diego Shakespeare Society and the San Diego Civil War Roundtable. This is an encore presentation of a talk I gave on January 24th at the Mission Valley Library concerning the subject of Shakespeare in the Civil War. Now, this may seem like an odd topic, but it gives us another way to try to understand everyday life during that momentous period. And you may think that Americans in that time would be more down to earth with no, uh, no need for highfalutin drama, and certainly nothing is a feat as Shakespeare. There's our, our man from Stratford. But in fact, an appreciation of Shakespeare was deeply embedded in American life in the mid 19th century and had been for quite a time, quite a while. Uh, moreover, a passing knowledge of Shakespeare was widely accepted as being an essential part of an educated person's cultural literacy, both North and South. The most dramatic illustration of this state of affairs is the fascination that Abraham Lincoln had for Shakespeare, and that's a subtopic I'll, I'll address later. But of course, the tragic side of the coin was that Lincoln was killed by a Shakespearean actor from a family of Shakespearean actors. But let me back up a little and give you some more background before we jump into the 1860s. From the earliest times, Shakespeare traveled across the ocean with the English colonists. Accounts differ as to the first proper performance of Shakespeare, of a Shakespeare play in America. Some sources have it as Romeo and Juliet in 1730, others as Richard III in 1750. The founding fathers were into Shakespeare. President Washington staged a production of Julius Caesar in the executive mansion in Philadelphia. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, traveling in England together, visited Stratford-upon-Avon. In his book, Democracy in America, published in 1835, the French traveler Alexis de Tocqueville wrote, there is hardly a pioneer's hut which does not contain a few odd, odd volumes of Shakespeare. And the Bard's infiltration of the heartland in antebellum America is suggested by Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, where he describes the two scamming actors, the King and the Duke, who parody Shakespeare and are later tarred and feathered and run out of town on a rail. We even have the matter of the so-called Shakespeare riot taking place in New York City in 1849 between fans of rival Shakespearean actors. The state militia had to be called out and 31 people were killed. The worst civil disturbance in the United States to that point, and which was only outdone by the New York draft riots of 1863. To get us a little closer to the Civil War itself, I want to share an episode described in James, James Shapiro's book, Shakespeare in America. In the period prior to the outbreak of the war with Mexico in 1846, the U.S. Army was stationed in Corpus Christi, Texas. To distract the troops, one of the officers, James B. Magruder, had a theater built to hold 800 spectators and four uh, comparison purposes of the outdoor stage of the old Globe Theater seats uh, 615, although uh, I'm sure their seats are much better than what uh, Magruder had. Now, Magruder, who later became a Confederate general in the Civil War, was known as Prince John. And you see there he's kind of a costume almost out of Gilbert and Sullivan. He was a natural showman uh, given to uh, amateur theatrics. And this is a talent, I should explain, jumping ahead to the Civil War, he put to good use during the 1862 Peninsula Campaign by deceiving uh, Union General George McClellan into believing the South had more troops than it actually did. And one way he fooled McClellan was to have the same troops march around in circles as they were being observed to give the effect of a much larger army. And I think of this trick whenever I see Hamlet staged. You remember the scene where Hamlet is watching the army of Fortinbras march to Poland. That's where the what is a man speech comes. And how in, in a theater, how is that staged without a, a cast of thousands to represent an army? 
Well, you have a small group of actors, maybe a dozen, walk on the stage, go off, come around the other side and walk again. And, and I think I like to think that's where Magruder came up with the idea. In any event, going back to the Mexican War, one production stage at that theater in Corpus Christi was Othello, the story of the Moorish general serving Venice who was tricked by his evil subordinate, Iago, into believing that his wife Desdemona is unfaithful. And initially, James Longstreet, we have him here, also later a Confederate general, was cast as Desdemona. And I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't find a picture of him without his beard and mustache. But uh, anyway, uh, and, and scholars would agree that, that such casting of men as women was certainly rings true to Shakespeare's day when women could not appear on stage and, and so female roles were assumed by young boys. Now, Longstreet ended up not playing the part because it was decided he was too tall at six feet. And that's, it was pretty tall for that, that time. So instead, future Union general and president Ulysses S. Grant at 5'8 was cast. Is a picture of him, a clean shaven Grant uh, in his younger days. Now, in later years, Longstreet recalled that Grant looked very much like a girl dressed up. He really rehearsed the part of Desdemona, uh, but he did not have much sentiment. Well, it turns out when the curtain went up on opening night, Grant also did not end up playing Desdemona because the actor playing Othello, Theodoric Porter, the brother of later Admiral David Dixon Porter, objected to Grant and a professional actress was brought in. What I think is so interesting about this incident is not only that you have this incredible Civil War who's who with Grant and Magruder and Longstreet coming together, but also it demonstrates how ingrained the Shakespearean tradition was at that point. You see, even if Longstreet or Grant had played Desdemona, this was not meant to be some kind of a farce, just men dressing up as women. It wasn't meant to be like Monty Python. Grant apparently diligently learned his lines and intended to deliver them from the heart as much as he could. But then the leading man objected to his co-star, as, as often happens to this day. And is also evidence of the degree of familiarity as with, with, with the and the possessiveness of the Shakespearean text that they wanted to make sure it was done just right. So this underlies how seriously they considered the canon. Now, in Shapiro's book, in discussing this production, he can't help thinking how interesting was the choice of the play. You would certainly think that the story of an interracial couple would have been rather controversial at the time, but Shapiro suspects that the soldiers watching the play may have been more focused on its themes reflecting military life. After all, the major impetus for Iago's contempt uh, for Othello was not necessarily racial, but professional. He, he had been passed over for promotion by Othello, uh, a certainly common condition. And many in the audience may have secretly sympathized with Iago for that reason. But, but also sitting in that audience in Corpus Christi, um, the aspect that had to be difficult to ignore, uh, nonetheless, with the war coming that they would be about to fight, which arguably led to the Civil War itself, was this matter of a, a, a man from Africa married to a woman from Europe. Now, and, and, but despite that, the play Othello was not only staged here in Corpus Christi, but was staged quite commonly, even though you would think it would be taboo, certainly in, and in, certainly in the South, but, but it was in fact regularly, regularly staged. Further, Othello was a frequent name given to enslaved men. You know, and I, I bring this up to show that despite what you would otherwise think um, uh, 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 would be the incendiary nature of this subject, Apparently, the status of Shakespeare was such that, that it was accepted and it overrode any, any kind of prejudice. Now, speaking of Othello, and to get us closer to the war itself, I can't resist showing this cartoon 
published in the British magazine Punch in 1861, just before the start of the Civil War. It's titled The Genuine Othello, and I'm, I'm not sure why genuine is hyphenated. And you see Othello here, an Othello character, poised between two proto Uncle Sam characters, one representing the North, the other the South. And it's captioned with a racist rephrasing from the play. Keep up your bright swords for the dew will rust them. Both of you, my inclining and the rest. Now, those are lines from the play where Othello tries to calm things down between himself and his uh, brand new father-in-law, Brabantio while Iago uh, uh, tries to cause trouble. It's an odd editorial message, to say the least, as if enslaved people didn't want a fight over themselves. Uh, this, this cartoon was reproduced in many Southern newspapers. And the if the drawing style looks familiar, it's because the artist is John Tenniel, best known for illustrating Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. And he was known for favoring the South and was, was quite nasty in lampooning Lincoln, uh, although he liked him once he was once he was dead. Now, as that cartoon suggests, you know, tensions were rising between the sections in the pre-war period. And politicians on each side were cherry picking quotations from Shakespeare to, achieve, to advance their points, hoping to convince people. So they sprinkled their speeches with allusions to the plays and sonnets. And they wouldn't have done that unless they knew it would resonate with their listeners, they, unless they were connecting with literate audiences. When people heard these references, they would likely nod in recognition or, or maybe would even just have subliminal appreciation uh, they weren't even conscious of. What are some examples? This is Congressman Roscoe Conkling of New York, a powerful figure. And he tried in one speech to persuade the South not to secede. He knew Southerners believed that they could survive as an independent country by virtue of their cotton, king cotton as the crop was known. But Conkling pointed out that economic forecasts were such that, this, that a seceded South based on cotton was not sustainable. And so, as he put it, King Cotton may have reason to groan that upon my head they place a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. And that is from Macbeth. Uh, and we know uh, this him, him bemoaning the lack of an, of an heir, no future, in other words. Now, on the other side, we have uh, Senator Louis T. Wigfall of Texas, uh, one of the so-called fire eaters, and he looks quite fierce there. And he thundered, I say that I would dissolve this union. I would fracture it before I would live in a government in which I was not the equal of any other white man in the country. And then he goes on to paraphrase from Hamlet. That drop of blood that's calm proclaims us bastard, cries cuckold to our father, brands the harlot, even here between the chaste and smirched brows of our true mothers. That is Laertes upbraiding King Claudius over his father Polonius' death. So this is an incendiary language meant to whip people up. As things continue to get worse, uh, we hear from then Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, later president of the Confederacy. In a speech delivered on January 10th, 1861, the day after South Carolina seceded from the Union, Davis referred to Lucius Junius Brutus, the Roman hero who abolished the monarchy and established the Roman Republic, and who served as the role model for Marcus Junius Brutus of Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar. Davis states that both men, would have brooked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. Davis here is taunting fence sitters, the way Cass Cassius taunted Brutus in the play. So now out in the open, we have the imagery of civil war brought on as a part of a fight against tyranny. And Julius Caesar is all about civil war. 
And this talking point was taken up by many Southern politicians seeing the incoming president as a tyrant. So by this point, we have Shakespeare weaponized. And against the backdrop of all this heated rhetoric, we hear Lincoln's first inaugural address in March, 1861. This is what personal injury lawyers would call the last clear chance to avoid an accident. The Southern states have seceded, but hostilities haven't, haven't yet commenced. Lincoln warns the South against trying to tear the country apart. And he asks specifically, will you hazard so desperate a step while there is any possibility that any portion of the ills you fly from have no real existence? Will you, while the certain ills you fly to are greater than all the real ones you fly from? Will you risk the commission of so fearful a mistake? Now that's a clear echo of Hamlet's great soliloquy from to be or not to be, considered the greatest speech in English literature. And it's at, at the end where Hamlet concludes, the undiscovered country from whose born no travel returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. And please notice Lincoln embellishes somewhat with the repetition of the word ills to drive home the point. And so, of course, so sad we, we don't have recordings of Lincoln because we could hear his cadences and how he would have put them together. Now, Lincoln closes his speech by referring to the better angels of our nature. That alludes to Sonnet 144, that mysterious poem about good and bad angels engaged in conflict. Well, Lincoln's argument is not enough, and so the war begins, and Shakespeare goes with. Appropriately, the battle, sang, the, the battle songs Hail Columbia, sung by Union troops, and the Bonnie Blue Flag, sung by Confederates, both contain the phrase, Band of Brothers from Henry V. Now, while you can imagine the life of a Civil War soldier could be horrific during times of battle, for extended periods, camp life could be pretty boring. Okay, here's some guys hanging around. As the old saying goes, war is long periods of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. Naturally, in the down times, the men turned to other amusements, uh, drinking, gambling. Um, but as I described with the Mexican-American War episode, uh, it was not at all strange for theatrical societies to pop up and for plays or segments of plays to be performed. And here we have the uh, Merchant of Venice by, from the 7th Regiment. During the war, soldiers would also, of course, write home uh, in letters of their experiences, and they would indulge their cultural literacy by, again, citing Shakespeare. One Indiana soldier, George W. Squire, describing, describing his feelings when other soldiers were returning home, wrote, when I see men of my acquaintance homeward bound, it is with difficulty that I keep from getting in a perfect panic to go to, but I think of the maxim, let thy fair wisdom, not thy passion sway. That's from Twelfth Night, and it means don't, don't get excited. One man who's commonly cited for Shakespearean references was Sam Watkins, a Tennessee soldier who after the war wrote a memoir called Company H, of which Margaret Mitchell declared a better book there never was. Now, at one point in his memoirs, he described his first sensation of being shot at. As he put it, I don't think I was ever more scared in my life my hair stood on end like the quills of the fretful porcupine. And that refers to Hamlet, when the ghost of Hamlet's father tells the prince that he could tell tales that would have the same effect on his hair. Watkins also describes a camp visit by Confederate President Jefferson Davis and Secretary of War Robert Toombs and his hope for good news. As he explains, I remember how good and happy I felt when these two leading statesmen told of when grim visaged war would smooth her wrinkled front, and when the dark clouds that had so long, long lowered o'er our own, own loved South would be in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now that's a, a some sort of a mangling of the opening soliloquy of Richard III. 
which was a play that we'll learn another American president was was very in, in, enchanted with. Now, high-ranking officers also got into the act. John S. Mosby was a dashing cavalry officer who often confounded the Union Army with audacious raids. Before setting out on one nighttime mission intended to capture a Union general, he alluded to the Tempest by vowing, I shall mount the stars tonight or sink lower than plummet ever sounded. Uh, a plummet being a plumb bob um, and to sound being a, a measure, a measure to measure, measure depth in water. And that refers to a line by King Alonzo in lamenting the pr uh, presumed drowning of his son Ferdinand. On the Union, we have uh, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman in describing how the enemy dispersed before his army as they marched through Georgia. He paraphrased Lady Macbeth from the banquet scene saying, at all points he has fled from us, standing not on the order of his going. Meaning they just skedaddled, not, uh, not leaving by rank. So we have politicians and soldiers quoting Shakespeare, not surprising, and we have the news media also quoting from the plays and using Shakespearean imagery. We earlier had that uh, cartoon uh, that we saw from Britain. This is one of the most famous cartoons of the Civil War, if not the most famous. It appeared during the 1864 presidential campaign when former General George McClellan ran against Lincoln. And I mentioned McClellan earlier when I said he was deceived by the theatrics of Prince John Magruder. Here we see McClellan in the character of Hamlet standing near an open grave holding Lincoln's decapitated head. He soliloquizes, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest. Where be your jibes now? This cartoon appeared following an accusation of callousness supposedly displayed by Lincoln while touring the Antietam battlefield. It was claimed Lincoln asked one of his aides to sing him a funny song. If true, that would certainly be an insensitive act in view of all the men who died there. McClellan's lines here come from Hamlet, in the graveyard scene, where a grave, uh, grave digger offers up the skull of Yorick, who was jester to Hamlet's father. Hamlet picks up the skull and meditates on the nature of life. And you see, I'd left there the words Chicago nominee referring to McClellan. The Horatio at, at, at far right is New York governor and prominent peace Democrat Horatio Seymour. And you see the White House is in the distance. The artist was Justin H. Howard, who was apparently a freelance cartoonist and had his work published in Harper's Weekly and Leslie's Illustrated and other notable periodicals of the time. It's a little hard to pin down his political outlook uh, since he seemed to have a number of targets. So he was not necessarily a partisan ca uh, cartoonist as many at the time were. But let me ask you, um, looking at this cartoon, is it entirely an anti-Lincoln cartoon? Um, it's certainly unpleasant to have yourself depicted as, as a cutoff head and, and, and attacked as insensitive to war dead. But, but look again, how, how is McClellan depicted? You know, he's, he's rather, rather fancy, uh, correct, and maybe somewhat pompous looking, but he is supposed to be Prince Hamlet. And now here's where we need to brush up our Shakespeare. Now, how is Hamlet the character described, at least in the first part of the play? He's indecisive. He's dithering. He, does, he can't figure out what he should do. Now, I would ask any Civil War experts, does that sound familiar? Um, after all, that was the problem with McClellan. He, he wouldn't move. He was very cautious. He was great at training, great at supply and so forth. But as far as attacking, that, that wasn't his thing. And Lincoln once joked, if McClellan won't do anything with the army, I'd like to borrow it for a while. Um, and even when he did move, as in the Peninsula campaign, um, Confederate General Robert E. Lee, with help from Prince John Magruder, was able to easily intimidate him. Um, and even in his one qualified victory, Antietam, when he had uh, the plans of Lee in his hands, he was slow to move. So anyway, 
we have to look at this cartoon on different levels and you know, a little more subtle level levels. And maybe it's one of those perfect cartoons that makes fun of everyone. But you wouldn't, it wouldn't be effective if everybody didn't know both Hamlet and McClellan. Now, I wish to focus a little more on Lincoln uh, and his interest in Shakespeare. And we, we got the, the odd couple there. Um, this was a lifelong interest of Lincoln. There's always, always the story that when he was writing Circuit in Illinois as a lawyer, he would carry a well-worn copy of Macbeth uh, in his back pocket as he rode from town to town. Uh, some scholars have said that might be somewhat apocryphal, but he, he did, it, it is clear from people around him, he, he did read deeply in Shakespeare. He could recite line after line after line uh, from, from the plays. Now, probably Lincoln's most interesting Shakespeare connection comes in the form of a letter he wrote to the comic actor James H. Hackett um, in August 1863. Hackett was well known for playing Falstaff, and Lincoln had seen him perform in that role. Hackett had sent a book to Lincoln that consisted of his thoughts on certain plays and certain actors. Lincoln wrote back to Hackett on Executive Mansion stationery, thanking him for the book and also giving his own thoughts. And it's a short letter, and I'll just read in pertinent part. Some of Shakespeare's plays I have never read, while others I have gone over perhaps as frequently as any unprofessional reader. Among the latter are Lear, Richard III, Henry VIII, Hamlet, and especially Macbeth. I think none equals Macbeth. It is wonderful. And he goes on, unlike you gentlemen of the profession, I think the soliloquy in Hamlet, commencing, oh, my offenses rank, surpasses that commencing to be or not to be. Now, scholars of Lincoln find the letter surprising as it is so forthcoming. Uh, despite a popular image of Lincoln as maybe outgoing or gregarious even, he was actually quite circumspect and, and certainly known to keep his own counsel. But here he's providing his unabashed opinions. It might be like a politician today uh, expressing support for uh, sports teams that aren't from the hometown. Um, it was controversial. Uh, some scholars have suggested that Lincoln felt willing to overcome his usual caution um, because he was starstruck by the attention of, of this actor that he was a fan of. Also interesting, he used the word wonderful. It is wonderful. And, and scholars have found he only used that word, or at least document, he only used that word one other time in one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. So, uh, but let me, let me parse that letter a little further. And here are the five plays that Lincoln specifically refers to. King Lear, Richard III, Henry VIII, Hamlet, and Macbeth. Uh, those are all, with the exception of Henry VIII, those are all quite well known. But what, what do all of those plays have in common? And to use the taxonomy of the first folio, the collection of, of Shakespeare plays, we have the histories, tragedies, and comedies. Here we have only histories, histories and tragedies, no comedies. And, and, and be aware, comedy at that time was not necessarily a, a laugh riot. It was simply a play with a happy ending. Um, you know, for example, the Merchant of Venice is, is, is technically a comedy, although somebody did not have a happy ending. Uh, it, and so, so here it's interesting that that he he just won't even though a man who had a reputation for being funny or jokey doesn't doesn't go for the comedies doesn't go for the lighter stuff you know and so and we have to look at these two these are certainly all intensely political political plays about leaders all right and uh, you know I'm surprised Julius Caesar or Coriolanus uh, aren't included. And the, the characters have a lot wrong with them. Um, so, you know, I think you can safely say that, that Lincoln's choices reflect his temperament, uh, dis despite his, his, his easygoing, uh, funny reputation. He, he was deep down rather fatalistic. And, and it's generally assumed that he suffered 
from some form of some form of depression. I know it's always hard to psych historically uh, psychoanalyze somebody across the the centuries, but um, but it's not. It doesn't seem surprising that he would be drawn to dark themes. He had this this melancholy. It's often referred to, and and remember he preferred Claudius to Hamlet. Uh, Claudius being a character who did great wrongs, as was as was true of Macbeth. And I think it's particularly interesting he includes King Lear, because as we know, King Lear is about the hazards, the perils, the division of the state in civil war. That certainly must have preyed on him. Now let me turn uh, to the other side of the coin. Um, his assassin, John Wilkes Booth. A noted Shakespearean actor, and of course, I have to mention how the the phrase assassination was popularized by Macbeth. Booth was from a family of actors. Uh, his father being Junius Brutus Booth, a great British actor, uh, who, who who eventually moved to the United States and settled. Now, through the war, Booth was a Southern sympathizer, and and yet he acted on stages in the North and continued to. And it's documented that Lincoln saw him perform, not in a Shakespeare play, but in a, a tragic romance from the same box in Ford's theater where he was shot, which is, which is really creepy. Uh, now his brother, Booth's brother, Edwin, was, was also a great actor, probably considered a better actor, but he was very much a unionist in, sen in sentiment and uh, that caused, certainly caused tension between the two. Now, if you've ever seen the landmark documentary by PBS, The Civil War, by Ken Burns, one of the more eerie parts uh, was how in 1864, despite intra-family differences, John Wilkes Booth and his brothers Edwin and Junius Jr. appeared on stage together for the only time for a single engagement production of Julius Caesar at the Winter Garden Theater in New York. Uh, the event was a benefit to raise funds for a statue of William Shakespeare in Central Park to commemorate his 300th birthday. And that's, that statue was put up and it still stands today. Although the last, the last time I saw it, it had a, a Yankees cap on it. Now, the brothers played to a capacity crowd of 2,000. Um, it's amazing to, to think of that. And in the production, somewhat incongruously in view of later events, Edwin played Brutus, while John Wilkes played Antony, and Junius Jr. was Cassius. The, the chilling segment of Burns' documentary comes when the promotional photo of the, of the brothers is, is displayed on the screen, and the narrator recites the lines of Cassius after the assassination of Caesar. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over? in states unborn and accents yet unknown. One television critic called this moment a fitting occasion to ponder the irrepressible conflict the way Lincoln sometimes did as a reenactment of Shakespearean tragedy. Now, as we approach the event that we must, uh, you can say there were omens. On Palm Sunday, April 9th, 1865, the same day Lee surrendered, Lincoln took a ride on the steamboat River Queen on the Potomac, and he enter entertained his shipmates by reciting from Shakespeare. A French visitor wrote, we were proceeding up the Potomac that whole day when the conversation turned on literary subjects. Mr. Lincoln read aloud to us for several hours passages from Shakespeare, especially Macbeth. The lines after the murder of Duncan when the new king falls prey to moral torment were dramatically dwelt on. Now and then he paused to expatiate on how exact a picture Shakespeare here gives of a murderer's mind when the dark deed achieved. Its perpetrator already envies his victim's calm sleep. And here are the lines, Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst. Nor steel, nor poison, malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Uh, a day or two later, Lincoln told his wife about a dream in which he saw a president shrouded on a cataphlac in the East Room of the White House. Like Calpurnia in Julius Caesar, Mary was terrified by what sounded like a portent, and her husband regretted sharing his nightmare with her. 
But like Banquo's ghost, he said it will not down. At the end of the week, on a misty Friday evening, and in a way that recalled Julius Caesar, Lincoln disregarded his premonitions and proceeded with plans to attend a performance of Our American Cousin. Now, Southerners were also superstition. I mentioned earlier the Southern talking point about Lincoln being a tyrant in the fashion of Julius Caesar. They also saw Richard III in him being to them monstrous and deformed. He was a really big, tall guy, gangly for that time. And when Lincoln visited the Concord capital of Richmond, Virginia, in April of 1865, just days after it was evacuated, some in the South recalled the line spoken by Richard toward the end of that play. Richmond, when last I was at Exeter, the mayor in courtesy showed me the castle and called it Rougemont at which name I started, because a bard of Ireland told me once I should not live long after I saw Richmond. And Lincoln died 11 days later. Now, as to the assassin himself, uh, the backstory is that Booth was obsessed with the character of Brutus from Julius Caesar and saw himself as one who would destroy a tyrant greater than Caesar. Uh, Nora Titone, who is the resident dramaturge with the Folger Shakespeare Library, has, has written of the rivalry between John Wilkes Booth and his brother Edwin, and has suggested that the assassination was intended as a dramatic act. The scene of the crime was practical, as Booth could enter without suspicion, since he was well known backstage, and he knew the layout. He even knew the play being performed, Our American Cousin, and so was able to time his shot to correspond to a laugh line. But at the same time, he leapt onto the stage. He didn't run out the back. He leapt onto the stage. So in a sense, this ended up being a very public execution, much in the manner of Caesar's on the floor of the Senate, as opposed to offstage assassinations of Hamlet's father or of King Duncan in Macbeth. So in this way, it's suggested that Booth intended to upstage his more talented brother Edwin for all time. After assassinating Lincoln, Booth was on the run for almost two weeks, realizing that the authorities were closing in on him. He wrote his final diary entry on April 22nd, four days before his death, alluding to Macbeth. I do not wish to shed a drop of blood, but I must fight the course. Tis all that's left to me. Booth had played Macbeth in 1863, so he would have been intimately familiar with the Macbeth's words as he accepted his fate. And remember, Booth would have been writing this entry as he was on the run, suffering from an injured leg, and distraught over how the South uh, did not rise up to protect him as expected. Now, the last example I wish to give of Shakespearean influence actually comes several years after the war. In 1870, for the first time, an African-American was elected to the U.S. Senate. His name was Hiram Revels. He, he had been a chaplain in the Union Army during the war and later an educator and local politician. His election would be remarkable enough, uh, but also he was representing Mississippi and took up the seat formerly held by Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. Now, unlike Robert E. Lee, um, for whom many in the North had some respect and grudging admiration, uh, even long after the war, Davis was pretty much universally despised by Northerners as a villain, as a Shakespearean villain. And so to indulge this continuing animus and to highlight the irony of, of Hiram Rebels as his successor, we have this cartoon by the one and only Thomas Nast, who uh, uh, was the nemesis of Boss Tweed and who gave us Santa Claus. Uh, here he is drawing inspiration again from Othello. We have His Excellency, Jeff Davis, just three years out of prison, by the way, and he's skulking in the hallway as the villain, as, as in the guise of the villain Iago. And he declaims, for that I do suspect the lusty moor hath lipped, it lipped into my seat the thought whereof doth a, like a poisonous mineral gnaw my inwards. And in the play, the seat refers not 
to a political office or a military position, but to uh, his place in the marriage bed, as Iago suspected a fellow sleeping with his wife. So you see, Nass has mentioned has managed to sneak in that that particular angle. We come full circle um, from Othello uh, being performed on a stage in Corpus Christi. Uh, now we have Othello in, or Iago in the, uh, in the halls of the Senate. And that is uh, the modest, uh, my modest survey of the Shakespearean influences in our Civil War period. Uh, now, when I gave the live presentation, we had a number of questions. Um, I do want to just highlight one, and it was someone asking, well, was Lincoln, uh, Lincoln is, is a presumably damaged person, was he drawn to some of these characters and figures because he recognized that in himself? And, uh, you know, it's a great, great question, great something to ponder. I couldn't really answer. I, ha I had my opinion. I certainly couldn't definitively answer, but it certainly is a good question about how he was so drawn to these dark figures. And, and, and as I said, he, he wasn't looking at the comedies. He was really looking at these darker themes. So um, a wonderful question uh, at, at the presentation. So with that, uh, I will conclude this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, survey and, uh, and say adieu.